Gandhi's principal notion, and again it's a contentious one, and we haven't got scope here to debate it fully, was the notion of ahimsa, non-harming other living beings. And uh, again, it's, an, it's not an idea that Gandhi invented, it's there in the Gita, perhaps paradoxically. It's also referred to in the Upanishads, frequently in the Mahabharata discourses we'll read uh, ahimsa paramodharma, the highest... Well, I think somewhere it says the mark, the characteristic of the presence of Dharma is Ahimsa. So Gandhi didn't invent Ahimsa. But his idea, and it's an interesting idea, is that Ahimsa and spirituality, spiritual realization, are identical. Because his point is that harming others, Himsa, will arise in your consciousness only when you are in the materialistic domain. One who rises to the spiritual level, the level of realization the Upanishads talk about, is inherently non-harming of others. This, this is found in the Isha Upanishad. I can't remember the exact verse, maybe verse 2 or 3 of the Isha Upanishad. It says, when you have that realization of the universal Atman, you never have any contempt, any desire to harm another, because after all, we're not different, we're all one. And therefore there can be no harming. So that was Gandhi's idea that Ahimsa was the, the characteristic of one who has acquired spiritual realisation. Because I will only harm you because of my lack of spiritual realisation. When I have the realisation, I don't want anything, I don't desire anything, I have no selfishness, I have no greed, I have no hankering, I have no hatred, I have no anger. I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about ultimately when I reach that realisation, then I, how can such a person ever do harm? So Ahimsa is then identical uh, with absolute spiritual realisation. So Gandhi takes that fundamental principle of Hindu spirituality, which has been around from ancient times and, and runs throughout Hindu teaching, and he applies that. It's not, again, he's read Christianity, he's read the Sermon on the Mount, he's corresponded with Tolstoy, but it's not that influence that is inspiring him, it's his understanding of the centrality of Ahimsa to Hindu teaching, which again inspires him, not just yeah, against the British as well, because he says the British are in India because they're greedy, violent, aggressive people who want to rob the Indians, therefore they should leave because they're that, that's, the, that's the right thing to do. But similarly, he says, um, people who persecute the lower classes, oppress them, drive them out and, and, and stop them sharing wells and things like that, they are also violating the fundamental Hindu principle of Ahimsa. People who discriminate against women, who abuse women, who, who, who uh, deprive women of their rights, they also are contravening the fundamental Hindu principle of Ahimsa. Therefore, caste-based discrimination, gender-based discrimination are anti-Hindu. They are completely at odds with Hindu teaching. Vivekananda is saying the same thing. You can't be like that. You can't discriminate. You can't abuse. You can't have contempt and despise any people if you are properly realized in the Hindu sense. Okay. So, I've I, 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 just really three short snapshots there of modern, or well, semi-modern, Hindu reformers, um, who in the, each in their own way, Doyananda by going back to the, the Veda, uh, Vivekananda by looking at, talking about the inner divinity of every living being, and Mahatma Gandhi with his emphasis on the, uh, the, 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 the principle of, the Hindu principle of Ahimsa, use these exclusively Hindu resources in order to reform Hindu society. And that's why I will go back to the point again. When Chidesta, Chidesta describes these people as Hindu Christians, he's made a fundamental error. Not wishing to be harmed. He is a, a wonderful scholar and his knowledge of Christian history is perhaps unrivaled. But when he moves into, into the field of Hindu, studying Hinduism, I think he makes a slight mistake on that. And he, he sees elements within Hinduism which are somewhat akin to Christianity and, and he presumes it must be a Christian influence whereas in fact as we've seen even in this brief discourse the actual resources that are used by modern Hindus are exclusively and entirely Hindu in their, in, in, in their attempts to, uh, to change Hindu society. Okay. Thank you very much.